Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me here today. We're going to be looking at uh, a Q&A with uh, lesson number seven and um, getting well beyond that halfway point. Uh, and this lesson is a really good one. It actually starts heading into a direction where we're really focusing on, um, you know, some graphical skills. And uh, let's take a look. I think what I'll do is I'll share my screen and we will take a look at the assignment, uh, review that, look at some examples, and we will then take a look at some of the questions that uh, I know there's at least one question in the Google document. And if maybe what I'll do here, I'll just share the link in the chat. So if anybody wants to pop a question in there, they're quite welcome to. <clears throat> and I've actually been, just to let you know, I've been focusing more on uh, compiling these sort of documents with the Q and A's, it just seems to me that it's, um, a really good resource, uh, for folks as they go through the course, but not only that, you know, often there'll be multiple people with a similar question and this does help, uh, help find, help them find that, um, that question that's popped up for them, or at least potentially. So let us take a look at the assignment. Just got to share screen here. And there is our question. And we will just shift over here <clears throat> to the lesson. So lesson number seven has sort of a an easy and a tougher part to it. So the, the local ecological survey, I would say is, you know, pretty straightforward and, and easier to, to address. Uh, and then when we get into the site cross section map, that is a little bit trickier. And uh, we will show you some examples of that and how you might approach it. Um, and some of the things to kind of look out for. So with the local ecological survey, we're just really, again, uh, looking at some site, more site analysis, right? And you'll probably notice with the course that uh, a lot of the course up to now has been all about site analysis, looking at soils and water movements, um, you know, sector maps, microclimates. So once again, we're looking at what ecological organisms are uh, um, in and around the project site. Uh, so we want to look at a few of those. We want to look at some pioneer plants. We also want to look at uh, five birds in your area. Um, we want the biological food chain and the different stages of succession. So let's take a look at those. I'll just bring up a example here. So this is a student from the last class in the spring. Uh, so this is her example and she did a nice job here. So here's her example of the ecological succession. And this might be a little bit different than, well, we'll look at another example here. This might be typical of what you see other students doing. So again, there's no, you know, real right or wrong way of doing it. <clears throat> Given the, this part of the assignment is only worth four points, um, you may want to really dive in and re change all the graphics and stuff, but, and you're quite welcome to, but, um, you know, realize that uh, you may be spending <clears throat> a significant uh, chunk of time on the second part of the assignment here. So again, here's an example of uh, the succession. So when we look at succession, it's really a reflection of what is going on in the project site. So we imagine that this a site can be uh, completely disturbed. And uh, amazingly, what happens is, you know, it's pretty predictable. 
uh, how the soils are going to respond to that because that's basically what's happening here. We remove what was, let's say we remove a mature forest and then we get a response of um, annual weeds and those develop into more perennial grasses and then we get some shrub material and then it heads back. It, you know, pretty much most places on earth want to be a uh, mature forest if they were left to their own devices. So <clears throat> it's interesting to take a look at your project site and see where your site may be. And it may be in several different uh, parts of this. I know where I live, I'm on five acres here and we have disturbed areas that are more in early succession and we have a nice chunk that's uh, second growth for us that uh, we don't do any maintenance in. So uh, it's an ideal when you can have these different types of successions because they will ultimately dictate what you can do in that area. If you If you took a disturbed piece of ground and you tried to plant a forest in it, you may find that you have some challenges doing so. Um, it has a lot to do with the uh, fungal and bacterial ratios within the soils and how they get thrown out of whack when there is disturbance and their ratios favor certain types of plant material. Um, it's much like if we went into an old growth forest and we were looking at um, trying to grow lettuce, you know, we wouldn't have much success. And not only because of, say, shade, uh, but it's the soil itself. It's very, very fungal dominant in this late stage. And these annual vegetables are more uh, bacterial oriented or at least kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. So I won't dive too far into that because that's its own um, a course on its own. Uh, but it is good to touch on it. And if you do want more information about that, um, it's really to do with the soil food web and some of Dr. Elaine Ingham's work. So there's lots of online resources with that if you wish to uh, check that out. So the next part of the survey is bird species. This is pretty straightforward and this information should be pretty readily available. Uh, but again, you have to, you know, observe what you're seeing on the project site. And a lot of this, you can make some assumptions. Um, certainly where I live, you know, we, we also get California quail. Um, I think we're near the top northern limit of uh, their range, but um, uh, not every location in uh, the area I live would have these either. So when you get into more urban areas, they tend to get pushed out, at least where I am. Uh, and then we're going to look at a local food chain here. So that is a little more broad and gives us a bit of an idea of how all these things fit together, uh, at least a few of those elements. And then we have the SWOT analysis. So that is pretty self-explanatory. And uh, it's really, this is really focusing on what you see your strengths and opportunities are given that you've gone through this exercise here. So it may be that you have uh, a number of different um, uh, levels of succession on your project site you may have only one you know that may be a weakness right you may want to grow annual uh, vegetables but the lot is heavily treed so there's a few things that could play uh, into that so that is lesson uh, number seven uh, the first item and of course we have some resources here okay so you can take a look at that. So the top two videos here really are about the ecological survey and you can see the remaining um, part of the assignment has really got to do with the section map. And for good reason, it takes a little bit of, uh, little bit of effort to do. So let's, um, why don't we take a look at that? Uh, actually, maybe I'll just back up. Does anybody, 
on the call here have any questions regarding uh, the ecological survey that you want me to address I, right now? I have a question. I, sure. I hope this isn't dumb, but on the uh, food chain slide, um, is the succession of uh, species there at the top producer, primary consumer, um, they as far as the the bugs at the bottom, they all have to be eating the bugs where the arrows are pointing down. Yeah, that's ultimately where we're heading, right? So okay, so they all each have to eat eat, eat each other. Is that? What I'm yeah. Well, let's let's um, just put my spotlight tool here. There we go. So let's just take a look at the hawk or the harrier. Uh, we know it's going to be prey generally. I mean, they prey on many things, but um, and I'm actually not sure the harrier goes after jays specifically. Right. I would say they're more rodents, just the way they fly and they hover. Yeah. Uh, they're quite amazing birds if you've never seen one. Um, and would harriers go after stonefly? Uh, no. Okay, so I wouldn't think I wasn't so. Sure what that meant, as far as the arrow, arrow, that that had to connect back to the decomposer. Yeah, and and I would do your best on this. Like, I'm not going to spend five, ten minutes going through <laughs> this slide. Just to let you know, um, generally speaking, my focus is on this sl slide on these different stages of succession, because I feel that that is a pretty high priority knowing and just getting to just learning about observe, you know, making a habit of observing any space uh, and where it might be sitting in that succession, because it just tells us so much um, and, and really does help. Well, it, it provides constraints, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, Oh, and James has a comment here. Seen bigger hawks eat smaller birds. Absolutely. Um, we see that quite often where we live as well. I, I was just referring oh, to the harrier. Um, I have seen those in my area, and they are quite amazing. Uh, and they probably do eat small birds, but they seem to be able to almost levitate. Um, they hold a spot looking for, it, it appears to be rodents. Uh, moving in the, the ground below, but it could also be small birds. Um, so thanks for that, James, for sure. Uh, just back up here. Yeah, so this is a, a spot that I would really put a lot of, you know, the takeaway when you, you leave the course, this is a, a, a nugget that you want to hold on to in terms of how you would proceed with uh, a design for somebody else. Now, I don't do an ecological survey on the projects that, uh, that we do. Um, but I inherently know in the back of my mind, what birds are going to be there and do the birds influence the design? Um, you know, they probably do in a very roundabout way, but we're not really gearing the landscape for birds. Uh, although they're a good indicator of, of, you know, the health of your ecological system uh, where I live, we have, you know, every night we've got owls chiming away. Now um, we get, we have chickens. So we do get a little bit of predator pressure th with eagles and hawks. Uh, the hawks have kind of switched to going after the small birds lately, but uh, it's very interesting to watch. And um, so it does give you an indicator of, um, of how your ecological system is situated, uh, uh, you know, in this moment. And uh, just saying that, I we were involved in quite a large project about 20 years ago uh, on an organic farm on Salt Spring Island uh, in British Columbia here. And um, it was just a, a degraded pasture we converted um, into really more of a park setting had quite a few in interesting elements in it and lots of plantings. And we noticed like 
the day we started putting large woody plants in the ground, boom, the birds arrived. I mean, they were always there, but they started to move into that space. So, yeah, so this, there, there are parts on this exercise that you will take away with you. Um, but uh, I, I would say with that food chain, you know, do your best with it, but don't get too worried if you see that there may be a minor um, conflict within this. So I hope that helps you, Melissa. I'm not sure. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Cool. Okay. So we will go on to the next uh, part here, the site cross section. And this is a very interesting. So now we're getting into graphical, um, you know, applying graphics. And that's, you know, in my opinion, uh, whether it's just traditional land design or permaculture design or regenerative design or whatever label you want to put on it, you know, there's two distinct sort of spheres in my, um, in my opinion, you have those ideas that are clicking through your head and that a, a lot of the course has been rolling up to that. We've been looking, and part of that is site analysis, looking at things, envisioning what's possible given the conditions on the site. And the other is applying all that onto um, either paper or uh, computer in such a way that your client can understand, uh, you know, you're articulating your ideas. And that is a whole course in itself, as you can imagine. And we've really tried to simplify that part of it for everybody using um, the template and the slides here. So <clears throat> this is the site cross section may feel like a bit of a stretch for, for some of you, but just do your best. Um, but let's look at what we're actually trying to do with this. Uh, so the whole idea of the site section is to take a point on the land uh, and, and draw a line. And we're going to, let's go and take a look at an example here. So in this example, <clears throat> we have a very small urban lot. And I, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, this was a duplex. So it's even, it's half the size that we, uh, we see on this, uh, the project boundary was here. Um, so what we do is we draw a line and we want to basically cut a slice in the, in the landscape and flip it up on edge. And we want to see what the landscape looked like uh, in terms of all of these elements. And the tricky part is in terms of the topography. So each end of the line will have some, some individual sort of designation here. It's A and B. Uh, I have seen people put an A and then an A apostrophe. Uh, you could do whatever works for you. Uh, I can show you, I'll show you in a little bit what we do with site uh, section maps. Uh, we don't do an A or a B, but we have an arrow that indicates the direction of the view. And that's important because when we get to this part here, we want to be able to tell which side of this line we're, we're standing and observing. So you can see here that there is no indication of what side of that line. Now we can deduce it because the house is here. So I can tell that we're standing in this location, looking in this direction. But this is a good example where uh, this student has some beautiful graphics and all of the things that have been asked for, uh, but there's no A and B uh, indication here. So let me just um, make that a little clearer. So there you go. Here's another example. It's a larger site. Um, there is the line and they've indicated on the bottom 
where the A and B is. So I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, we have the height and the labels for height and what these elements are and the lay of the land. So in an urban site, the slope may be quite gentle. And if we go to more of an acreage site, that may be a little bit more um, evident. I'm just trying to get another example here for you. There we go. There's one here that's uh, done quite well. And <clears throat> what we want to try and do, and it's obvious when we look at this, is we want the horizontal and the vertical scale to be the same. So that when we place a tree or the house or whatever's here is proportionately correct. If we look at this example, uh, that's the same, it's one to one. If we get into very, I don't think we are here. These are all one to one. If we were trying to depict a section across, you know, a large acreage, often what you have to do is have the vertical scale smaller uh, than the, uh, oh, sorry, opposite way. You'd have to have the horizontal smaller to cover that, you know, great length. And, and already this is quite long. This is a almost 570 foot line. But this is the sort of information we want to see. Um, the, the photos are a really nice addition. Uh, but this does give us a, a good idea of how that section of land is uh, set up. Now, how do we get this info? Uh, it's through Google Earth. That's one way. Uh, if you have topographic information of your property and it's your project site and it's a bit on the smaller scale, so it's an urban, you may be able to just uh, sort that out quite easily manually yourself. But on a larger parcel, you might have to uh, go with Google Earth. Now, there are some, if we go to the resources, there are quite a few resources here on how to do this. Um, I can give you a really quick example here. I'll just uh, load up my Google Earth. It'll take a, a moment to do. Uh, let's see here. We'll go back to that. Let, let's see what we're specifically asking for. And again, we want to go to the rubric when you're putting your assignment together and just see what's being asked for, right? So you can see with the ecological survey, if you spent, you know, hours on it, um, you know, it's only worth four points. So if you do want to spend a lot of time on it, that's great. Uh, but just be aware that that um, the section view is probably where you want to put the bulk of your time. But you want to show the plan view, which of course is that 2D overhead view. You want to show uh, the side view, which is the next, whoops, which is the next sheet here. And you also want to show all the relevant features and buildings and stuff. So, oh, I got Google Earth open here. So what I'm going to do, uh, let's see. Got to go somewhere. All right. Uh, we will pick a property down here. All right. So let's say, uh, let's say this is our project site. To get that information that we need, what we want to do, first of all, is draw a, oh, just waiting for this to tell me what it is, but it's not going to. Uh, we're doing a path. So let's say I wanted to 
to have this as my line, my A and B here. So you click at the bottom, you click at the top, and then you don't have to label this. You don't have to do anything. Uh, you just say, okay. And that puts the path right here. So if we right click that and we go to show elevation profile, I then get a profile of the line. And as you can see, I'm moving along the line on the bottom and it's, and it's doing that here for me as well. So it's pretty brilliant, right? Um, it's just unfortunate Google, Google Earth isn't terribly accurate, but for this exercise, it's a really useful tool. So hopefully that helps out a little bit. And again, there'll be um, an example of that, uh, a tutorial video in the resources here. So if you wanted to see that again and you don't want to have to go through this video to find it, um, you could find it in here, okay? Uh, we want to label, we want an accurate scale and we want to have the microclimates listed for each of those little sections, which is a pretty, uh, that's a very interesting thing to have to add. Um, again, it's diving a little bit deeper into that site analysis. What is each one of these sections like? And then the succession stage. So, um, yeah, so that's, that is, Lesson number seven, and that's the cross section. And we didn't go through here, but again, we want one-to-one -one ratio on the vertical and horizontal scale. So when we're looking at it, it's proportionate. We don't have um, either trees that are too long uh, or too short in relationship to the rest of the elements that are being shown. And yeah, so that's, I think, pretty straightforward. Um, there is a question up here and it relates to, to that. So Melissa had a good question. So it was all about the technique of measuring the height of a tree. Okay. And with a measuring stick, would it be the same if the tree was on a steep slope? No, if you were on a steep slope, you would want, if you're measuring the height of the tree, you would want to position yourself at a similar elevation rather than being higher or lower, because that would definitely affect your measurement. Video examples are on level ground, right? So that's ideal. Uh, so if it is on a slope, try and position yourself on the same elevation. So at the, you know, to the side of that individual tree, would a clinometer be the answer? So what I did, I'm just going to uh, switch my share here. What I did is I took a look at, um, uh, I do some training with a agrarian platform, uh, the Rex uh, Workplace, which is a farm design. And they have a brilliant, uh, well, it's under production, a brilliant um, manual that they're putting together. And they've, and in the forestry section, uh, which I believe is chapter five, they do have a section on, on tree height uh, determination. So you can take a look at that, Melissa. I can, um, I could uh, give you, send you a screenshot of that if you want. But to answer your question, if you look at this example, it is the same situation where they are using uh, instruments that are level. Uh, in other words, you're, you're situated level to the, uh, the base of the tree. So you'd have to position yourself. So that was the case. So there is a, a couple of methods. And of course, this is a simple method. 
so I hope that helps. Um, I'll just ask you right now, Melissa, is that sort of what you were after? Um, I'll take a, a look closer with some time to see if that is possible. I just know that I can't, as far as the measuring stick, where you have to uh, be far enough away mm -hmm. so that you can see the top place the <laughs> the top of the measuring stick to the top of the tree yeah. there's no place i can be uh right so anyway i'll i'll look well, at maybe there was a comparative method or something uh, and figure it out but thank you yeah, and yeah i've no already got a screenshot of this so thank you oh good okay no problem um yeah what i would do is if you're running into challenges with that is you know just do a guesstimate because whether it's let's say whether you have a, a douglas fir tree on a slope that's 100 foot or 120 foot or 80 feet you know it, it's probably uh you know it may impact what your your thoughts are in terms of what you could uh, do at certain times of year around it um, but there are other methods to figure that out and um because really then you'd be getting into more uh solar analysis and um what i would suggest there and i don't know if i have pointed that out before to everybody it's just uh, an app here let me just uh bring that up for you it's one that we use quite a bit And it is called Sunseeker. It's one I use. Uh, it's got to be more specific. There we go. So it's uh, quite a quite a clever little app. It does. Um, this is what I use it for right here on this screen, this three D screen. Uh, it's got a number of different. Uh, things that are super useful, but you basically activate the app, go into the 3D mode, and you you just hold the camera up or the phone up and looking through the screen, it'll show you the summer, the winter, the spring solstice, uh, currently where the sun is. And the, the beauty of it is it does give you uh, information on uh, how much sun at different times of the year that place that you're standing is going to receive sunlight. So it's quite vital for positioning greenhouses, or even if you're looking at trying to get uh, the sunniest location for certain crops, um, that's a good one to, to take a look at. So let me just see if we have gone through all of these examples here. Yes, we looked at that one. We looked at this one here. Um, I'm just going to show you what we have done in the past, and it'll be different to what we're asking you guys to do. Similar but different. So <clears throat> we do commercial landscape design, and uh, not that much of it anymore. I honestly don't... Um, it's, doesn't really drive me. It, it, it has this great potential in it. And the reality is, is that the landscape is the, the last item to be considered, um, not during the planning stage, but during construction. And it often gets uh, minimized <laughs> as much as possible. So it's a little disheartening. But with commercial design work, we're often required to submit uh, section drawings. And fortunately, my uh the software i use uh allows for that so we basically we have a three-dimensional model and we draw a line on it and then bang it will produce what you see here um, you know not in a split second it does take a little bit of effort on our part to tweak it <clears throat> however what it does do is it gives us, in this case, a view of this proposed development uh, from the road. So if you're standing on the road and you had that kind of perspective, that's what you would see. And uh, this is proposed, not what's existing. Uh, 
So it's a really valuable tool. Um, we honestly, I think that was the last, no, not the last, but it was, you know, we just haven't, we don't do these very often. Uh, now the reason for that is because our software, we are able to create, um, a three-dimensional model of our project site. It means we can basically fly around the site and take a look at it from wherever we want. Whereas in this, um, example, it's from one place, right? And that's that's the standard. I'll let, just let you, uh, I'll take a look at one more thing here just to give you. Hmm. Just have to find it. I had it open. Yeah, just bear with me two seconds here. Sorry about the. Okay. So this, just got to find it on my screen here. Hmm. There we go. So this is the same. <clears throat> same project and I won't bore you with it because <laughs> there's some boring sheets here, but uh, you know, this is just all about trying to convince the authorities that I um, you know what you're planning is in alignment with their bylaws. Um, so this is what I mean by a three-dimensional depiction. Um, you know, these houses up here were, existing and this is all a proposed and this is not by any means the best model but it did give uh, folks an idea of what it's going to look like and then there was different views that we could take and this was very early on in my learning of this part of the software so it was certainly not perfect by any means um, this is another example of where you might use a a section drawing <clears throat> is in a detail. So when we we specify um, for, for instance, in this case, we were specifying some slope stabilization. And we just did a, a little section drawing, very easy, uh, showing what the intention was along with some notes here. So you may find at some point if you're designing for others that that is one place you might use that strategy or technique. Um, so it's not the whole site, it's just one section of the site that we're trying to make it very clear what, what, what are our intentions here. And, and here it's basically a compost soil blend and uh, a seeded um, eco blanket, it's called. So with 50 millimeters. So the eco blanket is basically compost that has seed injected into it. It's quite an incredible process, makes for very, very um, quick uh, slope stabilization. So that gives you a little bit of an idea with that. Again, this, this it's, can be a bit of a tricky, um, exercise doing this, especially by hand, but it is a, a tool that'll serve you as you go um, through other designs, right? As you, you know, as you've put together, if, if you go on and design for others, you're going to develop what you feel or your own sort of graphical, um, approaches. And if you were to look at some of the work we did, say 10 years ago to today, you know, there's, they change uh, slightly, right? So we're always trying to increase the, the quality of that. And this better and better software will do that for you. Um, 
but that that is also a little bit um you got to be tricky there too cuz <laughs> the software we use is you know it's probably about $4000 to buy it and uh you have to use it quite a bit to justify that expense so we're um you know I I'm 60 this year and uh, or I turned 60 so we are kind of shifting our business a little bit and looking at doing less design in the future uh, and more of some other items uh, to diversify a little bit. And uh, then it, it throws out that question to us whether we're going to renew our license uh, yearly or, or not. Um, Cause there are some, there's overhead involved with, with designing. And actually one of the biggest things is the, for us and, something to keep in mind when you do design for others, especially if you have water involved in your design, uh, the liability insurance uh, is quite high where we live. And we're just a small, basically mom and pa operation now. Uh, my wife and myself um, I believe the design liability last year was, uh, it's over $4,000. So, you know, it, it starts to uh, ramp up and now that is important because if you do cause damage to, <laughs> and it is a design issue, you design something incorrectly, uh, you want to have something to back you up. You don't want to have to be forking that out. But again, you know, it's only really an issue if you are, are implementing water structures like rain gardens and ponds and stuff. So yeah, so that's a little bit about lesson number seven. Does anybody have any questions they want to throw out at the for answers right now? Or I should look at the document, see if anybody... No, there's no other questions on the document. We can talk about um, anything unrelated to lesson seven. We can... If anybody has any questions, you got 15 minutes left. Completely up to you guys what you want to do with it. I've uh, sort of covered off what I wanted to here. So you can consider that if you want to ask any questions. If not, we can uh, call it an early day. Um, maybe what I will do, I can just give you a quick tour of the software that I use that might be of interest. Let's fire it up here. It takes a little while. And I'm not suggesting that you would want to buy it by any means, but you can actually download and trial uh, Vectorworks Landmark. Uh, let's see what. All right, let me share that. So I'll just spend a few minutes here. And if anybody has any questions, just throw them in the chat or unmute. And um, we can take a look at that. So this is Vectorworks Landmark, and this is the version 2022. We have 2023, but we don't normally use the new version for mm, at least six months because there's always little bugs in the new versions. And <clears throat> I will show you what we typically provide people. This is a little urban project we did in uh, the mid island here. Um, and some of these graphics may not be ideal. Um, this is just a, a base plan showing the house footprint, some contours and a little bit of climate data here. So we kind of combine that climate aspect into our base plan. We have a, a scale bar a title and a north arrow. And you'll notice the north arrow is not up. It is slightly angled. And sometimes, and I know I, I will uh, impress upon people to always go north up. If you can be north up within a few degrees. I think, you know, that works. Um, it's much easier to work on the drawing when it's uh, in this state rather than slightly angled. But 
Um, if this was a commercial project, it would be north up. I wouldn't be messing with it because we have to share files with other, other cons consultants, but here we don't. So these are, uh, there's two parts to the software and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but, but basically there is the design component of it. And, and when I say that, those are design layers. So we create all these layers uh, and that's where we do our design work. And then the sheet layers are what is really your presentation. So this is what gets printed. Uh, and within that, uh, these are what are called uh, viewports and they are not actually the design. They are uh, so like a snapshot of it. And we can actually go and we can enter the design through the viewport. We can annotate it. Uh, we can do a camera view and do all sorts of crazy things with it. But I'll get rid of that. So that was our base plan. And then we had a sector map that we did. So that'll look familiar. Um, then, and you can see, this is one of the main reasons I like North Bean Up is just the summer and winter sector make a whole lot more sense when they're orientated with North Up. But that's just uh, my opinion. Um, there's nothing on that sheet. We did a water layer where we actually did a macro watershed. So very much like what, what everybody did here, but this was more... I guess on the micro side of a macro. So this is within uh, the city of Nanaimo and a little bit of uh, info here on their micro watershed. And then we had a little uh, swale and pathway in this um, drawing and it was going to be supplied by runoff through the adjoining uh, adjacent property that's uphill here. And you can see we have some half meter contour lines. So those are, you know, a foot and three quarters. <clears throat> They're a little bit on the coarse side. Um, and then here is our actual, here was our water plan. So it was a small space and we have this wood chip filled path going through a bed that is created here uh, along with a little rain garden. And, um, <clears throat> and an overflow, um, we have overflow off of this uh, rainwater catchment here uh, where we have a, a roofed um, patio area and some IBC totes for a collection. So they're able to collect 750 gallons and that'll, that's um, a good start for them. Um, then what we do, we do a water, so we do a sector map and we do a water layer and then we'll do an access layer. So access is really the circulation through the site, any hard elements. Uh, and then we do the soil layer. So this is showing walkways, um, a patio with a pergola and a privacy screen here. They want a place to cook outside. Uh, and then we get into the soil layer, and this is all that soft landscape. So you can see now this path and swale makes sense because we have a bed here. So uh, this bed's going to benefit from having some water placed in the pathway. Uh, the annual vegetables, and this is all fruit and edibles. And then these symbols here are uh, existing plant material. Yeah, so that's basically what we do there. And then uh, we we came up with the final concept. Uh, and then we do a planting palette. So we will send this to our client and say, okay, in these spaces, uh, these are the plants that we're looking at. Th these plants would work. And then if there's something within this that the client doesn't want, they let us know, <clears throat> and then we start to assemble the planting plan. And 
I certainly don't use all the plants that are here, but this is just kind of like a palette and it is kind of artsy fartsy when we get to the planting plan. I just, uh, we, we start with the woody tree and shrub elements and we place all those so we know where our structure is and what kind of privacy and structure we're getting from the woody significant plants. Uh, and then we will look at uh, the perennials and they are filling in the spaces and providing a different layer. Uh, if there's any climbing elements, we'll place it here. Uh, we're also identifying uh, that these are annual vegetables. And then we have kind of an overview of the whole thing. Uh, and then we'll, luckily <laughs> our software helps us with a plant list here because all of these symbols are actually um, hybrid symbols. They all have data attached to them. So that is indeed a, a Walker's Low Napita and it knows all about it. <laughs> uh, and it, we ask for a report on what plants are within the drawing. So we get this plant list and you could basically take that list, send it to a nursery and they will price it uh, and then you know your plant pricing so and availability. So this is a part that we don't, you know, get too into with the, the course, but having the quantity and the size of the pot is a, is a good idea when you get to the installation part of the uh, project. So again, North Arrow and scale bars are always something we, we do. We mention the scale plus add a bar. I, I like to do that. Uh, yeah, and then we have often we'll have a details sheet or two. And here we're showing <clears throat> uh, the patio. So we'll do a little 3D of it. Um, and you can even see here that we have the concrete unit pavers, sand and gravel, so that it shows those different layers. And we do that here. So, and you know, we're talking about section views. This is kind of a, a condensed version of it where we're doing a detailed view of this pergola. So this is from the front and overhead and then from the side. Uh, and then we have some notes here and a little bit of info on the patio. Uh, that's basically more something that'll be developed. This is going to be done by the installation will be done by our clients here. So they will kind of decide what kind of paver and the pattern, et cetera. This is just kind of a generic running bond that we've have showing there. And yeah, I don't think there's any other detail. No, um, there actually may have been, I may be on the wrong file here, but, um, because every day we work on a file, we will save a new version of it. Uh, that way we can always go back. But um, I believe we did a water detail. So we did a rain garden detail showing a side view of how the rain garden would look. Yeah. Oh, we got a question here. Sorry, I did not see that earlier. Uh, it's from Melissa. What do you do at the stage of installation? Do you have a set of contractors to use or do you let the client take over? Um, you know, 90, 99% of the time we're installing this. So we use, that's why we detail out the plan the way we do. So if, if we have an extensive list, we know where every plant's going. We know the size of them. Uh, we're able to price it. We get, we do fixed price for any of these installations. This is one particular case. Uh, this couple, young couple starting out, they wanted to do this themselves. So we're pointing them in the right direction on where to get plants and, you know, what sort of soils to use. Um, <clears throat> my wife, Angela was visiting this site a few weeks ago, um, providing some, guidance on how to get the, her annual uh, vegetables started. Uh, so if we weren't installing, 
we would be looking for a contractor for sure. Now we don't do masonry work. So we've, we've worked with a contractor um, that has done all their masonry work for a couple of decades. Uh, we've used a whole bunch of different people, but one person is <laughs> a really good fit for us. So we continually use them. It, it does fantastic work. Um, the other thing, we do all, all our own irrigation, all the site preparation. We bring a mini excavator in and we work with a, an excavation uh, contractor, but we're there during the whole time. So we are totally hands-on normally with these sort of projects. Um, doesn't mean you have to be. I would love to step back a little bit and have somebody else installing for us, but I have not found anybody that I can hand this off to and be comfortable that they're going to be able to pull it off. Uh, the alternative is, and this has happened, where we've had clients hire us to, you know, we've done the design and they want us to manage the installation. So we, we get other contractors to bid on it and we have uh, inspections during the installation and you know it's not perfect and the client ends up paying for the landscape plus our management fee so there isn't a real perfect um <laughs> answer to your question it really depends melissa if you want to like for me <clears throat> uh, i love being part of the install and after doing this for so many years, it's really hard to hand it off to somebody um, in terms of getting the same level of quality installed that we would do. We go, you know, we really go all out to, to do the best we can. So for, for you starting out uh, designing, yeah, I would start to see who's working in your area, installing landscapes that you think have been well done and just start small and go from there. Uh, but yeah, we do bring in other people. There's with, with a, any project, even if we're installing it, there's this real network of, you know, we have plant suppliers, material suppliers, excavation contractor that works with us, uh, masonry contractors. So it's all, you know, a coordinated effort. Um, so I hope that helps. Melissa, is that, do you, do you have any, uh, anything you want to add? No, that was awesome. I really appreciate um, your perspective and, and your experience um, and the comments there. Um, I can't install um, mm -hmm. I do the design work, but I don't have like a set of people I've ever worked with to, I've always been the one getting my hands dirty and I don't sure. want to do that anymore. So, right. yeah. So it would just, I guess, be collecting, um, mm -hmm. contractors and whatnot. And I'm not at that stage yet, but. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and part of that might just be starting to look at who's doing ecological installations in your area, right? And see if, you know, what they are doing um, is in alignment with what you'd like to see done, just in terms of how they prepare a site, um, what scope of the work they take on. You know, because when we, when, Angela and myself started our business, you know, um, for instance, I, I was all about soil and plants and soft landscapes. And so the hard landscapes were, you know, a new element we were working with. Uh, irrigation was completely new. Um, soon discovered that if I wanted the irrigation done right, I had to do it myself, which is, you know, unfortunate. Um, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, it, was, uh, it was great to do. I now have somebody I can hand off that to, but it, it's tricky because where I live, the, the quality of the average landscape is quite low. Uh, so it, it takes a little bit of research to find somebody who will 
do the, the kind of things you want. Now, the one way around it <clears throat> is if you have the, like the drawing I had showed you that we produce, you have some details that you put in there. You specify how much topsoil, uh, how much compost, um, you know, some details that will provide consistency. And um, where I live in British Columbia here, we have the BC Landscape Standards. It's a document that we can reference. So for minimum soil depths, minimum compost depths, you know, what those might look like, how, they, how they're created. So you may have that in your area. You never know. You look around. There's some associations that may have standards. Uh, certainly all the landscape architects would be working to, towards some standards. And those, even though that's traditional landscape, those are good to, to um, pull on for ecological work, you know. Um, yeah. It, I, that I'm in this project, not working for myself, I'm working for somebody else's property. There's um, uh, um, an interest in passing them off or giving them the information in which to have the implementation at their pace. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, want to make sure that, you know, I've got some good information, uh, mm -hmm. some good resources. Yep. to add to uh, the project because I will be handing them this project to to work on right for the next five years and I just you know anything related to I just I feel a little bit anxious about uh, not you know handing them off uh, untried mm -hmm. resources but anyway um, it's what it is well that's that's one area where you can um <clears throat> You can provide all the info you can, and if you're comfortable, you could say, well, I could manage this for you. You could set up. Now, that may not be a comfortable place for you to be. Um, it was for me because I essentially did that for two and a half years on a commercial level of managing and bidding landscape. So it was, you know, I knew the documentation to, to run with, but... Um, if you're if you're wanting to design and have others install, um, that's probably the path you'll want to go down. You know, albeit it may be slow, it may take you a number of years to to sort it all out to uh, a level where you're comfortable and find people that um, you work well with, um, and you're compensated fairly. You know, that's that's the tricky part is trying to. Um, provide really good value because um, a design can be quite valuable, but it has to be executed um, properly or it's, it's, it will have some, um, some weak links in it that will point back to yourself, right? Because uh, being the designer. Um, so yeah, details are a really good idea to, to include within your, your, your drawing, uh, yes. whether that's in these simple design sheets or in some text or there's so many ways to do it. Right. Uh, it's just trying to provide clarity to, so for instance, when we build a new bed, um, we want at least a foot of good topsoil there. Now, the site might have that, but where I live, it's 90% of the time it doesn't. So we'll strip the material off the site or off the area, like um, any bed that we're creating, you know, we'll paint out where that bed is. We'll have the excavator on site. We'll, we'll excavate out that top living portion, even the turf, and we'll put it to one side. And then all the fill comes out and we often will, uh, unfortunately, haul that off the site and bring topsoil in. And then when we, before we place the topsoil, we do all the irrigation um, that we can. And then we'll put that living material we stripped uh, off the proposed bed and we'll put it at the bottom 
and flip the turf upside down so that we're retaining at least some soil life. And then when the new soil comes in, uh, it'll be deep enough to smother out any, any um, potential weeds that would come up unless you, you know, unless you spot a really nasty perennial weed in there, like a, a morning glory or something like that, uh, bindweed. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it's um, years and years of learning, Melissa. So it'll take you a little while, um, a lot of trial and error and what works for one person might not work for another, right? So what we do may not actually be something that worked for you you may have to modify um, your approach a little bit but I would say the one thing that I might suggest is when we started uh, in the land design business um, we started with a few little jobs and then boom we had three enormous projects in a row and that was probably a five-year period we only had three jobs and the we were on the site full time. Um, it was during the, the late nineties when, uh, 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 a huge boom in the economy and the stock market and, uh, people could not spend money quick enough. It was a bizarre time. So <clears throat> where am I going with this? Well, if you can keep your initial projects, uh, at a size where you're really comfortable with them and just start to build on them. You know, we went from some small urban to boom, uh, large acreage, and it created a lot of, um, a lot of pressure. You know, I, um, I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. I'm glad I survived it, but, um, very, very stressful. Um, however, doing new things, is going to be a little bit stressful. It's just keeping it manageable so that uh, you're not putting yourself in a bad spot. All right. Well, yeah, no problem. Thank you, Anna Karen and everybody else uh, for attending today. I think we'll wrap it up now and uh, we'll look forward to seeing your lesson seven assignment next week. And um, if you run into any difficulties, you feel free to, to shoot me a note, but um, you should have most of the tools now to, to move forward with lesson seven. And certainly, uh, as you can see, you know, it's really all about trying to refine the graphical uh, part of that. And if you're doing yours by hand, it'll probably be a lot easier in some ways than doing it with the computer, but not to worry, this is all, you know, uh, a long-term process to refine that. So um, just do your best. And again, if you run into any uh, challenges, let me know and I'll do my best to help you out. But uh, thank you again for attending and we'll look forward to, to seeing your work. So see you later.